we've looked at here the last couple of weeks, Jesus there in Matthew chapter 19 has shifted his attention to addressing uh, various issues within the life of a Christian, looking at marriage and divorce. And last week we saw looking at those who uh, are not given the gift of marriage and who have, are called to live a life of singleness. And now Jesus sort of uh, moves on and there's this inclusion about a discussion about children and their fitting in with how did Jesus view them. And so this morning we're going to look at these three verses here and see what Jesus' word on children is. If you would, join me in prayer as we ask God's blessing on the preaching of His Word. Father, we know that everything exists because You have spoken. Father, our life in You exists because You spoke into us, giving us eyes to see and, a, and ears to hear and a mind to comprehend the truth of Your Gospel. And even this morning, as Your people, we are still dependent upon You to rightly understand Your Word, to have Your wisdom in understanding how to apply it into the, the various contexts in which we live our lives. So this morning we, we humbly ask that You would be with us in this time to, to rightly understand, to rightly apply and see the implications of this passage for our lives as individual followers, but also, Lord, for our life together as a congregation. Father, we are needy and we pray that You would help us to be strengthened and taught from Your Word. And it's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. When we think of the question, who is a member of God's kingdom? Who belongs to Christ? We've seen so far in our study in Matthew, back to chapter 17, that it, it is not those who gobble up forgiveness from God, but refuse to forgive others. We've seen that the Pharisee who comes along to Jesus asking, what's the least I can do and still be considered a good man? That that person is not a member of the kingdom of God. And we'll see next week that the proud ruler who comes to Jesus swearing he has kept all the commandments and yet refuses to follow Jesus, is not a member of God's kingdom. There are a lot of these negative examples, interactions with people that Matthew records, that these interactions with Jesus are saying, look, don't do that. Don't be that way. This is a bad example of someone who's outside the kingdom. And so when we ask the question, well, who's inside? Who, who belongs to the kingdom? And really in this passage, Jesus on two different occasions tells us, who it is that the kingdom belongs to. Twice, Jesus says back in chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, and in our passage today, Jesus says the kingdom belongs to such as these children. Now, by that, he does not mean that all children automatically enter the kingdom, but what he's saying is that the kingdom belongs not to the proud, but to those who are humble like a child. He says the kingdom belongs to those who seek His blessing, such as these parents and children who approach Jesus in the passage that was just read. And so when we look at this passage, a passage which you would be surprised, but there's a lot of, a lot of history behind this passage in the church. People have read a lot of types of things into this passage that are not there. And we'll deal with a little bit of that here in a minute. But what I want you to see is the primary truth that Jesus is trying to communicate here, and that is children are a model of the humility and dependence that should characterize Jesus' disciples. Followers of Jesus, those who belong to the kingdom, are marked by humility, a dependence upon God. They know that everything that they are and they hope to be is, is, is connected with Christ and not in themselves. And that's what Jesus says. When the disciples seek to hinder these children from coming to Jesus, He rebukes them and He says there in verse 14, Let the little children come to Me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is recognizing that in children there is this childlike attitude of humility and dependence for life upon other people. 
And Jesus' point is, look, my followers share that same attitude. They're not dependent upon parents as an adult, right? What, what, what they're saying is that you're going to be dependent upon the Lord just the same way a child is dependent upon their life, upon their parent. And so this really comes in application in, in two different ways. That Jesus receives the humble. That is who is a member of His kingdom. Those who have humbled themselves recognize that God's kingdom cannot be achieved by buying it with money. It can't be achieved by earning it, by doing good deeds, by keeping all the commandments as we'll see next week. The kingdom is received when you recognize there's nothing you can bring to God that would earn His reception into His kingdom. Not your strength, not your intelligence, not your so-called goodness and righteousness. The only thing that can bring you in is to recognize you need it. And there's nothing you can do but beg. Humble yourself. Lord, I'm totally dependent upon you to enter your kingdom. And so if you're here this morning and maybe you're not yet a Christian... And the obstacle for you believing on the Lord Jesus is that you feel like you're not good enough for Jesus yet. Well, in one sense, you're right. You're not good enough. You're, you need all the help to come from God Himself. You truly have nothing to offer God. But God isn't looking for something from you. He's here with good news that He has done everything you need to qualify for entrance into His kingdom. There's no tax to pay. There's no military service you have to sign up to sort of earn your way into the kingdom. No. It's a free gift to those who are humble enough to be indebted to God for all eternity. You see, the church that understands the heart of Jesus believes that Jesus is capable of doing much more for even those members of her community who do not yet seem capable of doing much for him. That's opposite the way we think. We tend to want to attract people to our groups who have something to contribute. But that's not God's kingdom. And that shouldn't surprise us because his kingdom is completely opposite of how the kingdom of this world operates. Jesus is going out and he's gathering nobodies, the rejects, the people that others in the world would look on and say, who wants to deal with that? And Jesus says, those are my people. Don't hinder them from coming to me. They have nothing to offer, and those are the people I'm looking for because they truly see their need of me. This is a reoccurring theme throughout the ministry of Jesus. Later on in, over in chapter 20 of Matthew's Gospel, we have another example of this where there's some blind men. Uh, and it says there, And they saw, as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed Jesus. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Two occasions. Where you have children who are deemed unimportant, a nuisance, get them away. They're going to hinder Jesus. Jesus has important work to do. Don't you understand that? Keep those children away. Because in that, they were not viewed as important. They weren't movers and shakers. They had nothing to contribute but to take. And then with the blind men, nothing to contribute, outcasts in society. Y'all be quiet. Jesus isn't going to deal with you. And yet, what we find is those are the people that are actually open to Jesus' kingdom because they recognize they have nothing to offer. They've been humbled. And so for us to become a Christian, to enter into God's kingdom, there is this fundamental humbling of oneself to say, Lord, nothing in my hands I can bring. My only hope is that you will receive me based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That He died on the cross to bear my sins. That He lived a righteous, perfect life that someone has to have to live in your presence. And that Christ, if I simply trust Him, will remove my sin, clothe me with His perfection, 
and I will be one reconciled to God. That's what's being said. And Jesus said children best model that for us. They show us the humility and the dependence of what it is. And so if you're an unbeliever and you feel like you have nothing to offer and you've got to sort of fix that before Jesus will bring you on to His, His team, that's farthest from the truth. Don't buy into that lie. Simply believe in Him this morning that He will make good on the promise He's made to you. But maybe you're here this morning and you're an unbeliever for another reason. You may actually think you're a believer, but you're not. Maybe you're an unbeliever because of your spiritual pride. You're not willing to humble yourself and acknowledge you can never accomplish what needs to be accomplished to be accepted by God on your own merit. Christianity is, is a crutch. And a lot of times people don't like that and so they try to create a false version of Christianity that makes them be able to keep their pride, their self-worth. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that that is not the case. There is no way to, to strut into God's kingdom. And if you say you can't have that, well, then you won't have it. And you, like the rich young ruler we'll see next week, you will walk away from Jesus not right with God. Because that is a key component of a person who is a part of God's kingdom. They are humble and weak and fragile and dependent upon God for their very existence. And they're not hiding it. As a matter of fact, they glory in the fact that that's the way God's kingdom works. If you're here this morning and you are a Christian, we cannot move beyond this truth. There is a temptation. I, I feel it in my heart. It, it seems like every day that goes by, the longer and longer I become a Christian, the easier it is to forget this truth. And here's what happens. is we understand, yes, we have to humble ourselves. We're totally dependent upon the Lord. But as we become a Christian, we start saying there are all these things that we need to do. Christ has called us to make disciples. He's called us to, to pray and to read the Scripture and help lead other people to Christ and disciple other people in their faith. And there's all this work and all this service to do, and the Bible teaches that. But if we, if we only focus on that part, what starts to happen is we start to think we're, we're pretty important. God needs us. Now, if you were to hop in your car after this service and you're driving home and you drive by and see this family and this parents are outside and they're raking leaves and there's little children out there, five or six, seven, eight years old, and they're helping rake up. Now, you wouldn't walk by there and say, boy, I'm sure glad those children out there. They'd never get that yard raked up. If you think that, that's because you've never raked leaves with a child. Or you see some mother or a dad baking something in the, in the kitchen and the child wants to help, right? Can I help you? Well, not really, right? We'll let you participate, but you're really not a help, right? We get that. And yet, the point Jesus is saying is that child helps model. When, when God says we've got, to, we've got to go out in the world and make disciples, we start to think we're helping a little more than we really are. I'm somebody. God needs me. Now we know theologically that's not true. So we know better to say that out loud. But we can start to act that way. Because we've forgotten that the kingdom belongs to those who really recognize, even in their service to Christ, my service isn't quite essential in the big scheme of things. I serve because I love my Father. But make no mistake, even my service is dependent upon God's empowerment to do it. So I can't take credit. And, and, the, and Jesus is saying, look, you guys are just, you're hindering these children, but they're really here as a, as a walking, living object lesson to you. God places these children before us to show us our role in His kingdom. Even after we've been a Christian for a long time. We are still helpless, weak, fragile, dependent upon our Father for everything we need. We never move beyond that. And when we forget that, we will become a souring influence in the lives of other people. 
because we will get the I'm important mentality. When in reality, we could drop dead and God's kingdom will continue to advance. We must never forget that so that we can remain a humble individual follower of Christ, but also a humble congregation that seeks to serve Him. So as you look upon children, the next time you see a child helping an adult, or you see a child who's, who's showing that they, their neediness, let that be a message from God. This is you. This is me and you. You're just like this. You need me for everything. And when we forget that is when trouble comes into our lives. That's the primary truth. Children are a model of the humility and the dependence that should characterize us as Jesus' disciples. I think a secondary point that can be drawn from this point, it's not the main thing, but I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's implied in this passage, is that children are important to the heart of Jesus. Children are important to the heart of Jesus. Far from nuisances to be avoided, children are God's special gift in many ways to the community of believers, and we are to embrace them. Right? I think one of the primary things is that living object lesson that's there. We're so prone to forget it, and so God just fills our lives with all these children who show these children are so needy. That's right. That's you. Right? So you've constantly got that before you as you see children. But they are also, as I said, this embodiment of what the kingdom looks like. A reminder for us. And so, these children, and I think we could broaden this out to say that we should welcome and encourage in Jesus' name, include all those who are in this needy position. That we have to make extra room for. That they have, have to have extra grace in dealing with them. Those can be actual physical children. Those can be people who are in a, a position spiritually as a child, right? They may be an adult, but a new believer. Those who are considered unimportant or undesirable in our larger society, those who are dependent and vulnerable. I think, I think that includes that in this passage. And as we saw earlier, or earlier over in chapter 20, we see these blind men, right? There's this constant expression of how the disciples or the crowds try to push those people outside of Jesus' purview. But instead, Jesus makes an effort to bring them in. And I think that we as Christians, as a church, ought to welcome and encourage the involvement of those people just as Jesus did. We are to care for our children, nurturing them in every way, particularly in regards to spiritual things. And what does this mean? Well, I think very simply at the, at the simplest point, we should pray for them, right? We should pray for them and pray over them. One of the things that we do is we have a, a prayer guide that has the information of members of our church. And in the back of that, we have a section for it lists the children of members in our church. Right? As we're praying for those in our church, one of the things we can do is pray for those children. To pray that they would come to know Christ as their Savior if they don't yet. To pray for their, their spiritual development if they're already following Christ. That's a, that's a commitment, as a matter of fact, that we make together in our covenant as a church to pray for the salvation of our children. I think this implies that, that we ought to have as a priority the evangelization of our children. A lot of times people sort of look down on that, and we need to use wisdom in how we do it. We don't want to be involved in manipulating children, right? That's not the case. But we should take advantage of the, a child's openness to the gospel. And not like the disciples, perhaps, think that children were incapable of being spiritually reached by Jesus. The Bible doesn't teach that. And so we ought to be faithful to put the gospel before children, our children, and call them to respond to that message of salvation in repentance and in faith. This is where we have a value of ceremonial expressions of the value of children. What we call a parent commissioning or child dedication, right? We're acknowledging the gift and the value that this child is and the, and the work and the investment that has to take place to invest in that child so that they are raised in an environment where the gospel is present. 
This is where we talk about the value of family worship. Not necessarily something that you, you know, you, people hear that and often think you got to do that every single day. That's not the case. But to find times within your rhythm as a family where you're gathering together outside of our time here on Sunday morning, you're making a priority to worship as a family, to study the scripture together. And again, there are a variety of ways that can look. Not every family should look the same. You know, I, I just ran across a resource this week on family discipleship, a very little small book. You see, not many pages, 158 if you really want to know. So not much. And I think this book does a great job of balancing and helping people not to, to establish certain practices as the be-all, end-all of what everybody ought to do, but give some very practical tips on how you can do that. You need to think about, particularly fathers, of leading in this way of what that plan looks like for you and making sure that it's taking place. And of course, there's the daily instruction, which is primarily what we do. The opportunities that we have, the conversations that take place. Those moments have to be captured and used because children matter to the heart of Jesus. That ought to be reflected in our investment in them as well. And of course the example of godly living that we can give. And the spiritual formation of children, while that is primarily the responsibility of individual parents, it is still something that the church is called to be involved in. Churches have to think through, right? We have to think through how we're going to most effectively pass the gospel on to the next generation. Pray that we have wisdom in knowing how to do that. Those that are involved in our, in our children's ministries as we have them today in our youth ministry, right? We want those things to be functioning in a way that honors the Lord and is the most effective means of communicating truth to younger people. What's interesting that we find here is that there's, there's, there, there's not a lot said in specifics. Those who advocate wrongly infant baptism uh, misuse this passage. They often use this in Luther, particularly in Martin Luther in his text. I love Brother Luther. But uh, on this particular issue he reads that in there. You'll notice that it, it doesn't say there in verse 15, and he laid hands on them and baptized them and then went away. That's not what happened. That wasn't the practice. There was a welcoming. There was a concern for the spiritual welfare of these children. But these children were not believers. And so there's no mention of that. There's no mention here about how we best welcome children to Jesus. Those who get into the fight about whether children ought to be worshiping with their families or whether they ought to be off in an age segregated type instruction area. Jesus doesn't land on that. And sadly many times people in trying to to get an, a leg up on their argument, they want to go to the Scripture and make the Scripture say and back up their position, and that's using the Bible. Preachers and lay people both do that. It's the wrong way to handle Scripture. The Bible doesn't answer how is the best way to spiritually care for children. That means we have to use wisdom, and it's going to look different in different contexts, okay? And we have to be okay with that. The key point that Jesus is making ultimately is that children serve as that model of what kingdom humility looks like. And then after that what we see is that Jesus had a heart for children. And whatever approach we take on, people ought to be able to look at that and say, you know what, I may not do it the way they do, but I can't deny that they in their deepest heart of heart are welcoming and are concerned about the spiritual welfare of children. And if they've got that, you know what, I think they're okay. Because if they needed more, Christ would have told them. And where Christ is silent, it's wise for me to be silent as well. We as people who are interacting with children have a responsibility to have the same heart for these children that Jesus Himself had. So when we think about this passage, we think about Jesus' concern for children. He makes it very clear here, first and foremost, that these children are before you as an object lesson of the kind of person who belongs to my kingdom. Humbly dependent upon people, in the child sense, for everything they need. And Jesus' point is, look, have that disposition towards me. Recognize that every single day and every moment of that day you are dependent upon me for your existence. 
for your relationship. Everything is dependent upon me. And then secondly, we see that children within our midst, whether they're our own children, whether they're children that are part of this church, whether they're children that we have an opportunity to influence outside of our congregation, our heart and attitude towards those children should be not viewing them as something to be set aside for more important ministry, but to see them as an essential part of the ministry that God has called us to, that we would have a heart for them, and that would be modeled both in our attitude towards them, and how we pray for them, and how we're not negligent to speak God's Word into their lives, recognizing that they have the capability of responding to spiritual truth. Brothers and sisters, that's how Christ responds to this group of people who are often excluded. He welcomes them and holds them up as an example to follow. And so I ask you this morning, have you learned from their example? Have you embraced this humble attitude of total dependency upon God? That's what we strive for. That's what ought to be our heart of calling out to God to say, Lord, help me to do that. Help me to recognize where I stand in relationship to you, totally dependent. And with that truth, I ask, how are you in dealing with your attitudes towards children? Do you see them as a mission field, as an opportunity to pass the gospel on to the next generation? Or do you tend to see them as a nuisance? Someone who gets in the way, hindering us from doing real, actual ministry. Again, we may disagree on the best way to deal with those things. But we have to be in agreement that they are worthy of our time. They are worthy of our prayers. They are worthy of our investment as we seek to communicate God's truth to them. Because after all, that is the example that Jesus lays before us. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you.